Hello, I wanted to show you these um, samurai figures that I have. Um, it's an unfinished project really. I've had them a long time. Um, I've got stacks of unpainted figures still to do. Um, and the last time that I put brushed a figure was about two years ago. Um, so it's been in um, abeyance for quite a long time. Um, so I wanted to show you the figures and to discuss why that is really. Um, so they are um, all from a manufacturer called the Assault Group and they are figures from the medieval Asian uh, range. Um, and they're basically um, figures that I'm going to use eventually um, for a period of Japanese history known as the Genpai Wars, um, which took place at the end of the 12th century, um, notably between two rival clans, the Taira and the Minamoto. And um, essentially it was a struggle for um, dominance at court and political power, political influence over the emperor's court. Um, the Taira uh, had basically um, adopted a tactic of marrying their daughters um, to the Japanese emperors, um, which meant that uh, they were always um, in a position of influence at court. Either they they were either the brother-in-laws of the emperor or there was a mother of the emperor um, who was a member of their clan um, and it gave them a great deal of influence. Whereas the Minamoto um, were basically seen as a kind of um, rough and ready, uncultivated um, clan that were based up in the north of the uh, main island of Japan, Honshu, um, and were resembled in a way a bit the bit like the marcher barons um, in medieval England. They were they were on the frontier, um, maintaining order. Um, uh, so basically they had a lot more military experience than the Tyra, but the Tyra were the ones that had all the influence at court. And um, the war broke out um, when uh, one of the um, heirs to the throne was overlooked in favour of um, the Tyra candidate. Um, so he went to the Minamoto looking for support um, and war broke out between the two clans. And the war eventually was won by the Minamoto, um, a particular chap called Yoritomo Minamoto um, became shogun of Japan. Um, and that established a kind of military dictatorship um, which lasted uh, right through the next century, I believe, um, based in Kamakura, uh, which is a, a city to the south of modern day Tokyo. Now, most war gamers of my age in particular um, probably got into samurai war gaming um, because of uh, a book written by James Clavell called Shogun, which was then um, serialised on the television. Um, this is my DVD copy of it. Um, it starred Richard Chamberlain um, as the main hero. Um, and this really introduced uh, Japanese history to a large part of the uh, Western Hemisphere. Um, really good book, really good TV series. Um, but it's set obviously in the period when um, a period of European exploration and colonization um, 
when they first came to Japan. Um, so it's set during the age of um, sailing ships, of gunpowder, um, and it's a much later period than the Genpai Wars. And um, equally, the other influence on a lot of people was um, the Japanese film maker Kurosawa, um, famous for the film Seven Samurai and Kag this film Kagamusha, um, again all set in a much later period. Um, that period being um, the Sengoku Jidai, which is the age of the country at war. Um, and my interest in this period, the Genpai War period, um, stems from um, the 1990s when I had a, um, an Amiga and there was a game available for that called Lords of the Rising Sun and it was basically a strategy game that was interrupted by the occasional arcade um, game um, and it was based around the uh, Minamoto um, uprising and um, you basically played the Minamoto and the object was to gain control of, uh, of Kyoto. Um, but it's, it sparked my interest in this period and um, the, the, the problem, it's not just, it's not just a fad with me, I, I, well it is, a fad, it is a fad with me, but I, I really don't like um, mixing um, different historical periods and um, there are plenty of people I know who have got samurai figures, um, samurai armies, um, but unfortunately that they, they are all um, set in that later period and um, there's a number of reasons where I feel <coughs> that they don't, they don't mix, the two periods don't mix. Um, for one thing, the um, style of fighting was completely different. Um, during this period, um, obviously there was no gunpowder, so there were no muskets, no cannon, um, no arquebuses, that kind of thing. Um, and the samurai themselves um, uh, were far more attached to the bow as, as a, a principal weapon. Um, they did, they did obviously fight with Katana and Nodachi and so on, but um, at this time they, had, they didn't have a problem with using the bow. Um, it was considered a martial art in the same way as sword fighting was. Um, and that had disappeared by the, by the, the time of the Sengoku Jidai. Um, and secondly, um, the samurai had a very kind of chivalric code when it came to fighting. Um, so they would, for instance, never gang up. Um, for, they, they preferred individual prowess um, when they were in a fight. So they didn't fight as a group. Um, they fought as individuals in a, in a very similar way um, to knights, um, the, the, con the contemporary p the period in, in Western Europe. Um, <clears throat> and finally, the, the, their appearance was different from, um, um, from the later period. The, the style of armour had changed, the, particularly the helmets changed. Um, to give you an idea, Um, this is a, a magazine article um, back in. I've got. I think this is dated 1990. But this is a this is a um, a portrait of Minamoto um, no Yoritomo. So it's it's a portrait of the guy who eventually became shogun, and you can see that the um, the, the armor is much more colourful, uh, far more decorative. Um, they have these side panels in particular on the helmets which are uh, really intricately patterned. Um, they would frequently have an armoured sleeve um, so it's a different um, design to their main clothing um, and this was intended to partly to fend off sword cuts but 
mainly to keep the, this um, bulging fabric away from the, the bow. Um, so you can see on the, in this picture that um, there's a, an emphasis on archery um, in, in, in the weapon itself and in the clothing. And the, um, the figures themselves um, are a lot more difficult to paint than, than the later period. Um, so this is one of the few ranges I know, the assault group, that actually do uh, a wide variety of figures from the Genpai Wars and um, they, they are fantastic figures, I really like them. Um, I'll give you a much closer look at these um, a bit later, but you can see they have they have all the detail on them, they have all the intricate knots um, of the cords, um, they have these side panels on the armour and on the front of the figure. Um, I don't know the names of all the, the technical names for all the particular panels, um, but there's an awful lot of detail to paint on them. Um, which is one reason why it's taken me so long to to complete this project. Um, and um, as I say, about two years ago, I just became exhausted at trying to um, complete the army and wasn't really finding any suitable rules that I could use the figures with anyway. So I kind of put them on the back burner and um, I've still got a huge number of figures to paint. Um, mainly um, figures with bows, because all these samurai figures that I have here on horseback or, uh, or on foot are all armed with no duchy and katana. Um, so basically I've still got a huge amount of work to do on them. Now the other problem that I've had um, is is um, finding a suitable set of rules to, as I say, to, to play them with. Um, I, 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 sort of tend to, I tend to buy, buy figures um, simply because I'm kind of in love with the period. Um, and then, um, then kind of try and cope with the problems A of painting them and B of playing with them. Um, which I think is a very common trait in um, in war gamers. They have this sort of butterfly mentality. Um, purchase mountains of lead, and then they stay in cupboards and in attics unpainted for years. And that's that's the way I am as well. Um, but um, when you when you start a new period, um, you've immediately got a bit of a problem because um, you you you're obviously not going to have a large number of figures at the beginning so you're going to be kind of drawn towards skirmish type rules um, and um, at the kind of time that I began this project um, there wasn't a great deal out there in the way of samurai skirmish games um, Warhammer had a series of skirmish size games, um, not based in the Far East, but um, for instance, they had a game called Legends of the Old West and another one called um, Legends of the High Seas. And um, on their website, they did have a downloadable um, game um, that some um, enthusiast had posted uh, called Legends of the Rising Sun, which was based on the game mechanic that set in, um, set in medieval Japan. I thought I might possibly use that, but unfortunately um, Warhammer pulled all their historical commitments and um, luckily I downloaded the rules before then, but um, that kind of fizzled out. Um, and then along came um, Saga, which is a, a, a rule set that I really enjoy, and um, I, I thought immediately that the 
the game mechanic for Saga would work really well for this period. Um, but it did involve me trying to um, invent my own battle boards. So I, I began by um, trying to um, create two battle boards, one for the Tara and one for the Minamoto. And um, I, I made my own um, Saga dice. I'll show you. Well, basically, um, I don't know how well it is. Yeah, you can see those, I think. I basically created some transfers and used um, some different Japanese characters. So that's the character for um, a mountain, that's the character for bamboo, and uh, that's the character for the moon. Um, so I chose some fairly sort of bog standard um, kanji. And then um, obviously one of them, I think the, if you remember, the mountain is the six, the bamboo is one, two, and three, and the moon is four and five. Um, and as I say, I invented my own. Um, Backer boards, um, but it didn't really. It didn't. They didn't really work. I, I, I sort of came across a lot of problems. Um, in particular, um, in Saga, if you give the, the in Saga there are there are basically three troop types: the Hearth Guard, Warriors, and Levy. Um, and that corresponds quite neatly with the assault groups Genpai Wars range because they have samurai, they have a group that they call followers, I haven't got any of those painted up um, but I have unpainted and then they have peasants so they have, they have got, these are the, these are, this is a peasant figure they have got three troop bands that you can use but in Saga um, if you were to give the hearth guard, um, a bow, um, and it's rare that you are allowed to do that. The Normans are one example with William the Bastard that is allowed to um, arm his uh, hearth guard with bows. But as soon as you do that, they lose an armour um, class, so they go down from saving on hits of saving on five plus to no, sorry, hitting on 5 plus to hitting on 4 plus, to be, being hit on 4 plus, um, which makes them more vulnerable. And that doesn't work with samurai um, because the rationale in, um, in Dark Age Saga is that um, they have, in order to gain the bow, they have to relinquish their shield. But samurai didn't have shields, they relied on um, the use of the sword, the katana, to fend off blows as well as to, to parry blows as well as to strike blows um, and they relied on their armour and um, were these figures to get into um, melee they would simply put their bows to one side and draw their katana so that, that it doesn't make sense for them to lose um, a value, their armour value by giving them bows um, and on top of that, if you don't if you don't do that, then there's nothing really to stop you um, giving all your hearth card bows as well as swords. So you you're probably going to have to introduce a rule where you're limited to one unit of of samurai allowed to have bows. Um, so you can see it begins to get a little bit um, a little bit of a problem. And then on top of that, um, you have this issue where they really prefer to fight as individuals rather than to fight in groups. So it makes it makes the sort of units a little bit of a a problem. Um, and what else? And also two-handed weapons. So um, the no dachi is a, is a large two-handed sword. Um, same thing as say a danax in um, in saga. But again, if you um, give a figure a Dane axe in Saga, their armor goes down because they've had to relinquish their sword, and that doesn't apply. That doesn't apply to a samurai. So I began to have some slight problems with that. Um, 
there was another issue as well I can't can't recall at the moment um, but essentially I began to find that um, it was proving a little bit too difficult to um, invent some boards for Saga and that was one of the reasons why I sort of gave up on the on the project um, but after that uh, <coughs> there were some other other rule sets that have emerged um, most noticeably Craig Woodfield's uh, set of rules called Ronin which are published by Osprey and they do have a um, uh, ad adaptation at the back of the book um, for the Kamakura period, so specifically for this period. Um, but the problem I then have with that set of rules is that um, you're really talking about a dozen or so figures in a game um, per side. Uh, you're not talking about a game on this scale. What I like about Saga is that um, you can, it, it, Saga is kind of a, a large skirmish game or a small battle game really um, and I was really looking for a set of rules um, that would that would be on a slightly larger scale than Ronin offers um, and now there's another set of rules as well called Dice Show which is exactly the same um, you couldn't really play it with more than about a dozen figures per side um, so it's it's kind of it's been a bit of a problem because basically um, in order to get a game with these um, figures, uh, I was kind of being forced to either invent my own rules, um, which means that um, I've got to provide uh, both sides if I were to play an opponent, um, because uh, they're not going. A lot, as I say, most people have. Um, samurai figures for a later period and um, it means introducing them to my own set of rules so it's going to be very hard to find an opponent basically um, and then once you go up into the one if so if I were to then um, expand this army it's going to take me ages to do I, I'm hoping that I'll, I'll be able to make a, a kind of a, a another start on it in a couple of months time get the figures out and start painting again so I will get there eventually but um, where that's taking me is that I'll end up with enough figures to put them on um, multi-figure bases so instead of having them um, instead of having them based individually like this I'll have them say four to a base and then that will allow me to kind of start exploring um, some other wall sets. Um, so the ones that I've kind of got in mind are um, possibly Hail Caesar, which I think would work quite well. Um, possibly Field of Glory or Fog as it's known. Um, um, the one issue I've got with Fog being that um, They have, they have got a supplement to Frog called Empires of the Dragon, which has army lists um, for this period. But unfortunately, they're, they're a little bit too accurate uh, or too historically precise um, because they tell you to base the figures with a mixture of um, samurai and followers on each each base and treat them as a mixed base um, uh, I think they describe them as a war band um, so we're, we're I to do that um, and that is perfectly kind of legitimate thing to require um, because that's exactly the way that the samurai fought in this period they, they fought as individuals um, but one of them would be mounted and then they would have a number of this is the osprey but, but this is a depiction of figures from three. Then they would have a number of followers that would um, run beside them and fight alongside them. But so he is the kind of equivalent of a medieval knight, and these guys are, are sort of retainers, and that's how they fought. Um, and Fog is the only set of rules I know 
that does accurately describe that, that um, style of fighting. But the problem then being that I will base them in that way and then not be able to play anything else other than Fog with them. And I, Fog, aren't, Fog isn't a bad set of walls, but it's not, not my favourite set of walls. Um, so I'm still in a bit of a dilemma. And then finally, um, I was thinking about Sword and Spear, um, which, as you probably know if you've seen any of my other um, video, this is one of my favourite sets of walls. It's written by Mark Lewis. Um, it is Sword and Spear. Um, it's principally um, uh, an ancient through to the me medieval period, large scale battles, set of walls. Um, the one problem with that being is that uh, he doesn't include any army lists in the book. Um, you have to go to the website in order to download army lists. And he hasn't attempted to produce any army lists for the Orient, for China, Korea um, and Japan. Um, on the back, quite on quite a understandable basis that he says he doesn't know enough about the about the period um, in order to do it accurately. Um, so you would have to make up your own army list, which I haven't got a problem with. But the thing that the thing that's kind of probably going to draw me towards sword and spear is that, as I say, it's almost impossible to find anyone um, to play against in this period because no one else that I know has an interest in it um, and I discovered when I first started teaching myself the rules of sword and spear um, that it does make a very good solo game um, because you're drawing dice from a bag um, it, 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 there's a kind of level of um, or a degree of unpredictability in it um, which is ideal um, because you don't exactly know what the opposing side is going to do so you can play solo games so I think I think that's basically the way I'm heading um, so anyway that's the kind of uh, uh, synopsis of, of where I am so far with these figures but I, th I thought I'd show them to you really just to be able to discuss um, the sort of problems you have when you're setting about on a new project anyway um, Partly to also to kind of demonstrate how um, how kind of uh, um, unreliable I am in terms of my projects. I've got so many others on the go as well at the moment. Um, and this is just my kind of butterfly mentality. I, I, as I say, most war gamers of my age have got huge dead mountains um, and huge numbers of unfinished projects. Um, but I think I think these figures are really nice, so it's it, it's worth me just sort of putting up a video of them anyway. So um, in a moment, I'll give you a close up look of some of the figures, um, and then that will be followed by a slideshow of some photos I've taken of them, to just as a bit of a, a sort of a slideshow at the end of the, the video. So at the front here um, is a command figure put him on a larger base so he would have been suitable as a, a warlord figure in Saga set of walls. Um, so he's on horseback obviously. Um, got another figure there which um, you can see is holding a banner of some kind. Um, so he would have worked in the Saga set of walls as well as a banner figure. And another command figure there, um, this time on foot, um, just up the hill behind them there, a group of warrior monks, so high, um, they're all armed with Naginata. Um, <coughs> Although they look, these these figures are obviously a lot easier to paint. Um, I didn't really get the effect I wanted with them, um, and it's I don't know how you'd go about it really. But the black overgarment is actually quite um, 
or it was in historically quite diaphanous um, and underneath that these monks would be wearing armour um, but I really don't know how you'd reproduce that um, on a solid sort of sculpt unless the, unless the sculpt actually did have some kind of um, relief on it to show you the the armour underneath but I found it very hard to to paint them um, wasn't particularly happy with the way they came out <clears throat> but one of the nice things about um, the assault group is um, once you've purchased a certain amount of in value of figures um, they give you these uh, one-off um, uh, how would you describe them the sort of unique um, collectors sort of pieces that they they don't sell they just um, give them away with their with their ranges when you purchase so much um, so that figure there I decided would make a very good um, command figure for the uh, for the monks um, he was one that uh, the assault group just sent free I think they're the excellent company the assault group and I notice they are beginning to go to shows they never used to attend shows but um, I see they're going to be in Antwerp this year and um, They'll be at Wapner Tech in York in February as well, I saw them advertising, so um, um, it's worth looking out for them if you see them at shows. So behind here, um, these four figures on the right here are all armed with the larger sword, the two-handed Nodachi. Um, and then beside them is the... Uh, main kind of body of samurai that I've painted so far. Uh, these are all armed with katana. Uh, the 16 of these I believe. Um, I've taken some individual pictures of them to uh, give you a better idea of those. That's coming up a bit later in this video. And then um, Next to them are the cavalry. Um, again, all armed with katana, but um, I've still got to paint um, the mounted samurai archers. Um, I was quite pleased with this banner. Um, the uh, Tyra had a symbol of a butterfly which is what this is um, and there was no nowhere to purchase a, a transfer of it and no way that I could paint something as um, so if I can get a little bit closer and keep it no way that I could paint as anything as um, intricate as that so what I did was um, downloaded an image from Wikipedia of it and then created my own um, decal by printing it onto decal paper um, and it came out very well so um, I've got plans to do the same thing for the Minamoto as well who had quite a, an intricate design symbol which was of a, a flower called a gentian um, which I would have found it impossible to paint as well so all things that I've got, um, got to do <coughs> Um, but as I say, I think they're really nice figures, um, but so much on them to paint that it just takes ages and ages and ages. Um, and in front of them here, we've got another group of um, warrior monks, this time armed with bows. Uh, oh, I don't think I pointed out, there's another couple of, um, another banner and another command figure there and the other side of the monks I've got another mounted figure that would do as another warlord so if you're talking about sword and spear I've got what is it one two three four five command figures there so I've nearly got enough for two armies and then finally at the back here I've got a group of um, peasants sort of armed with assorted weapons um, I wasn't too happy about the way I painted these either I mean they'll do 
that um, I didn't spend too long on them. Um, and they they kind of reward a little bit of attention, I think, with these sort group figures. So I've um, not done them justice really in the painting. But anyway, that's um, so that's a little moving tour of the army as it is at the moment. And um, coming up next will be a slideshow of the photographs of the of the figures with um, a little bit of music rather than my commentary.